Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel. Douglas McGregor praises Tucker Carlson's recent journey to Russia, highlighting his courage in meeting with President Putin. He criticizes the prevailing narrative in Washington, D.C., which often demonizes Putin. McGregor commends Carlson for offering viewers an unfiltered look at Putin's perspectives, noting the Russian president's aid lib delivery without notes or a teleprompter. He applauds Putin's detailed discussion of Russian history from 932 to 1918 is largely accurate. His portrayal of the Second World War was criticized as weak and misleading because he omitted the role of communism and Stalin, which are integral to understanding the conflict. Instead, he swiftly moved to contemporary events discussing his interactions with presidents and his view that little changes regardless of who holds the presidency. He highlighted a peace agreement between Russia and Ukraine that was thwarted by outside intervention, suggesting that had it and it signed, Ukraine would be in a better position today with fewer casualties. He aimed to underscore two key points. He emphasized Russia's enduring presence over the past millennium, asserting that Russia will not be easily eradicated despite facing formidable foes in history. He dismissed the effectiveness of sanctions cite Russia's abundant resources and asserting his resistance to external pressure and interference in his country. Speaker 1, 1, 27. He questioned the motives behind Western involvement in eastern Ukraine, attributing it to the influence of a small group of wealthy individuals who wield power in Washington, including in the media and politics. He criticized the decision to engage in proxy warfare against Russia without consulting the American people expressing doubt about the possibility of fruitful dialogue with Washington in the near future. He suggested that a change in leadership in some European countries might lead to a re-evaluation of the situation. He stressed that Russia has no intention of attacking Western Europe and desires an end to the conflict. He noted that while some Americans may have gained new insights from his remarks, he remained skeptical about any immediate shift in Washington's stance. He underscored the concerns of many Americans regarding border security particularly among those who entered the country legally. He criticized the lack of thorough screening for the approximately 9 million individuals who have entered the country without proper vetting, highlighting the potential presence criminals and even terrorists among them. He lamented the disconnect between the sentiments of ordinary Americans and the attitudes prevalent in Washington, attributing it to financial motivations. He likened Washington to occupy territory controlled by wealthy donors who influence policymakers through campaign contributions. Speaker 1, 2, 49. Despite the gravity of the border issue in terms of national security in the economy, he observed a reluctance among politicians to address it effectively. He predicted that the situation would escalate, especially during economic downturns, leading to increased public frustration and questioning of governmental priorities. He expressed horror at the situation involving pharmaceutical companies conducting experiments in places like Central Africa and Ukraine, where there is limited accountability and regulations. He highlighted the distress felt by Russia over alleged evidence suggesting the development of biological weapons targeted at Slavic peoples. He described the potential manipulation of to make Slavic individuals vulnerable to certain diseases as a genetically engineered horror story that must be stopped immediately. He questioned the influence of money and power in Washington, emphasizing the need to distance from such unethical practices. He noted his surprise at the deployment of five carriers, highlighting the Navy's tendency to emphasize the Chinese threat as a means of justifying its large surface fleet, although he doubted its effectiveness. He stressed that China is unlikely to desire war due to its struggling economy, with millions unemployed and returning to rural areas. He pointed out the influx of single Chinese men into the United States, noting concerns about intellectual property theft by some Chinese individuals. Speaker 1, 4, 13. Drawing from experiences in Korea and Japan, he emphasized the historical pattern of Chinese appropriation of useful information. He advocated for measures to address these issues without resorting to war, including stricter border controls and expulsion of individuals engaged in illicit activities. He suggested that China would find alternative destinations for its citizens if necessary. He asserted that China's military investments primarily focus on defensive capabilities, particularly missiles and rockets, aimed at deterring potential attacks from the United States Air Force and Navy. However, recent revelations indicate widespread corruption within the Chinese military, 
with instances of high-ranking officers involved in selling rocket and missile parts on the black market and other illicit activities. This pervasive corruption extends throughout Chinese society, prompting significant measures by the government to combat criminality, including the execution of numerous senior officers and arrests related to substandard shipbuilding practices. Despite its growing military capabilities, China faces challenges in confidence regarding its submarine fleet and banking system, with signs of economic instability emerging. He likened China to a giant blue whale navigating the oceans for sustenance, posing no significant threat akin to killer whales or great white sharks. He highlighted the repercussions of China's economic policies and central planning, challenging the notion of China as an unstable economic force. Speaker 1, 5, 43 he concluded that China has no interest in engaging in a war with the United States. He acknowledged being acquainted with the general storyline, but admitted he hadn't yet read Said's latest account, noting Said's reputation for accuracy. He expressed his current focus on the Middle East, Eastern Europe, and border issues, explaining his limited attention to Said's recent work. Regarding the Navy's role, he suggested a propensity for the Navy to strive for relevance, sometimes excessively. He emphasized the evolving nature of technology and warfare, advocating for new strategies and structures in the armed forces. He underscored the significance of this observation, noting that many Americans may not fully grasp the implications. He highlighted the likelihood of operations being carried out with Ukrainian collaboration, primarily led by the SAS British forces due to their technical expertise in handling new weapons technologies. He emphasized the vulnerability of surface combatants, including ships from various nations, to a range of modern weapons, including undersea drones and aerial drones with diverse capabilities. He stressed the necessity of reassessing operational strategies in response to evolving threats, especially for ships stationed close to shorelines. He pointed the increasing risk faced by surface vessels, leading to a conceptual division within the Navy between submarines and potential targets. Speaker 1, 7, 6. He underscored the omnipresence of surveillance technologies, making hiding at sea or on land increasingly challenging. He acknowledged the significance of King Abdullah of Jordan's recent remarks, noting the complex challenges he faces in maintaining stability within his country, particularly with a substantial Palestinian population expressing grievances and desires for armed conflict across the river. He recognized the delicate balance King Abdullah seeks to maintain between the Palestinian and Bedouin populations while striving for Jordan's prosperity and security. King Abdullah's concerns about potential Israeli incursions into areas like Rafa, which could result in significant civilian casualties and potentially spark regional unrest were emphasized. He highlighted the broader Arab sentiment of anger and frustration towards perceived Western support for Israeli actions which could fuel broader regional conflict. He cautioned against the prevailing dismissal of Arab capabilities to respond effectively, noting the potential involvement of countries like Turkey and Iran, which possess significant military capabilities and face internal pressure to act. He expressed doubt about President Biden's intervention and anticipated further escalation from the Israeli side until substantial external pressure is applied, which he believed may take some time to materialize. He observed the dire situation in the Sinai highlighting the lack of access to clean water and food for the several hundred thousand people living there amidst the larger Egyptian population heavily concentrated in the Nile Valley. 